Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. I'm John Zipper, I'm your host for Week to Week, and I'm going to begin with a mea culpa, because last Week to Week, I said right here on this stage that Paul Vallis would be the next mayor of, Mo of Chicago. Um, I predicted it, I predicted it strongly, and of course, he lost. So, my predictions are, you know, I hope no one like is a better out there and actually put money on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, I confidently predict this time that you'll hear all about this on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News tonight. Uh. <laughs> or if he, if he doesn't cover it, maybe Don Lemon on CNN. It's, it's big news. You'll catch it all. <laughs> Meanwhile, we're going to be talking about lots of stuff, including Dianne Feinstein, abortion, <laughs> maybe even Tucker. So uh, sit back and relax. We've got a great conversation, and let's meet our panelists. On the far end of the stage is Joe Garofoli. He... <laughs> senior political writer at the San Francisco Chronicle and the host of It's All Political on Fifth and Mission podcast. In between us is... How did we, how, how, why did they get a laugh? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know the address. Yeah. <laughs> um, Marisa Lagos is a politics correspondent for KQED News. <laughs> and she's the co-host of the Political Breakdown podcast. So, right. Also yeah. funny. <laughs> Andy Warhol said, basically, at some point, we're going to be spending all of our week beyond like 15 different podcasts. <laughs> he did say that. He did. Um, <laughs> uh, um, two minutes in. Wow. Well, <laughs> okay. Let's talk about our first topic, and that is Dianne Feinstein, uh, California senior U.S. senator, is the center of attention as she remains on an extended health absence. Uh, from the U.S. Senate. This has not only fueled the race to succeed her in the next election, but it has uh, kind of spawned a lot of calls that she should resign now and not wait for that. So, Joe, the Chronicle made a lot of headlines around the country last year when uh, you reported on her health and concerns about her, her performance. Um, what do we know about the current status of Diane Feinstein's health and Sorry. The same. Uh, she is not due to come back anytime soon. She's uh, had suffering from complications from shingles. Uh, she thought she would be back um, within a couple of weeks, but that was early February, I believe, or mid-February, when she, when she first uh, took office, or first um, took ill. And, um, you know, uh, one of my colleagues uh, wrote the other day that, you know, sometimes shingles take, you know, if, if it goes longer than two months, sometimes it could be with you for a long time. And especially in seniors, she's 89 years old. So right now, you know, she's not due back anytime soon. And that is very bad news for Democrats. Why? <clears throat> she is the decided, um, for the only thing Biden can do right now is uh, appoint federal judges. Uh, there's nothing gonna get done in Washington. Uh, and so uh, with, a, with a divided government, so what he can do is, uh, is appoint judges, but he can't appoint them because he has to get them through uh, the uh, Judiciary Committee, the Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, right now, it is a deadlock, 10-10, um, uh, between Democrats and Republicans. Feinstein would be the 11th vote. So if it's 10-10, it stalls. Well, her buddy Lindsey gave her a little help last week. I felt like that was maybe a, he, he helped get a few judges out of judiciary. Yeah. Maybe in, in, you know, payback for that hug that she got so <laughs> yes. much heat over. Like, I mean, he, he is one of the few people in Congress I could see doing that, though. Like, to, because, and these were not controversial judges. Like, That's at this the thing, point, the they're just ones. holding them up to basically stick up the middle finger to the president. So, um, yeah, I felt like that was like an interesting little twist. Well, Maurice, but do we know what people around her are saying? Is like, why won't won't she resign? Or I mean, does is this a matter of? I mean, she's had a long and distinguished career. Yeah. Does she? Is this like a point of honor for her to finish out the term? Uh, I just want to say, like, this is a really hard story to talk about because you want to be respectful both to like 
her as a human and also to the incredible career she's had. And because we've all been hearing that it's not just shingles, that she's having, you know, memory issues and other things that are like, you know, we can't diagnose. But from what I understand, you know, talking to people who know her and talking to people of people, <laughs> um, I think it's, I think it's her personality. Like, I, I think she does not like to be backed into a corner. I think she felt that, you know, her reelection was a real, you know, show of support by the electorate for her. Um, that was only in 2018, you know. And I think that the more people push her, it seems like the less likely she is mm -hmm. to want to resign. And she, because of her history, she has sort of the weight of being such a pioneer. Uh, and also and as a woman who's been like, don't tell me my place. I'll tell you my place. Exactly, and 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 that's going to be hard to to root out. Pelosi said uh, a couple weeks ago. She said this is <clears throat> all these calls for her to resign are based in sexism. Yeah. Well, yes, that's a part of everything. Both can be true. Like, Both can be true. She she maybe should consider resigning, and a lot of old white dudes should have resigned sooner. As Absolutely, well, right? Yeah. Like like that was for old white dudes, right? <laughs> Um, but yeah, I think it's it's also like to step back and you know do what we do, which is like pendicize. Mm -hmm. It's just like fascinating what a headache this would actually cause for Newsom if she stepped down at this. Oh, point. it's he like is, he's hoping she it, doesn't. Step yeah, down. he can't want this. And honestly, as a voter, I think well, there's like tell, an tell argument why. on both tell sides. Why. Yeah. So basically, <clears throat> back in twenty, I don't know, times flat two, circle, a couple years ago, two years, twenty twenty one, twenty 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 one. He promised Joy Reid on MSNBC that if she were to resign or not serve out her term, he would appoint a black woman. Um, which in itself, to me, was a statement that, like, you know, we've only had three black women in the history of the U.S. Senate serve, and the whole point of appointing somebody is to give them the incumbency advantage, yeah. right? So now he's in a position where Barbara Lee is running for Congress alongside Senate. some other people for Senate, sorry, for, the, for that Senate seat. Uh, she has long been seen as the most obvious choice as an appointment, but you would be giving her a leg up in that race. There's obviously a lot of pressure. You know, Pelosi has endorsed Adam Schiff. Katie Porter's got a lot of powerful folks on her side. Um, and I think there's also a sense from a Democratic point of view that, like, we've already, you know, she's been in, we basically haven't had an open Senate seat in my adult life, right? I mean, yes. <laughs> Kamala was a coronation. Like, it was not a race. So I think that there's also a sense that if he were to put his thumb on the scale, that would, like, you know, give us another 50 years without really picking our own senator. And if he doesn't pick Barbara Lee... Who he, would he pick? Well, he, number one, he would piss off uh, the most uh, de uh, devoted members of the Democratic Party and black women, right. the most loyal voters. Um, and and then it's like... It's not like pick? he wants to run for president. Yeah, I mean, just, just in case he might want to be looking down the line, you know... The, the guys, you know, he'll, he's a, he'll still be only, what, 50, 59 when his, right. this term is done. So if you don't put Lee in, then you put a placeholder? Well, we've and always talked that about, we've always talked about Holly Mitchell, who was a oh, longtime yeah. state senator. Uh, she now she's, the, yeah, she's on the board of supervisors in L.A. But she wouldn't be a placeholder. She's way younger than Barbara. Lee, right. She's, right. She's like 50, in her late 50s. And... Um, and besides, she's running for re-election. You know, she's like, yeah, and I so had, I asked I her, had I dinner like, with her last year, and she loves her job right now. <laughs> yes, she's like, I, I don't have to go anywhere. Right. I have more constituent. Yeah. Um, no, I asked her, and she's like, um, thank you. It's a compliment, but I'm not interested. Then it's like, okay, well, then who? Right. So if you, and also, like, what would be the point of a placeholder if the whole purpose of saying I'm going to appoint a black woman is to give that you know, some of those advantages that historically right. have not been afforded to black female candidates. So it's a real pickle for Newsom if something happens. I thought it was interesting that Ro Khanna came out and, and was one of the first to say was it interesting? she should resign. It's like, well, and who does Ro Khanna support in the race? It's Barbara Lee. Yes. <laughs> yeah, one second, yeah. Self. <laughs> yes, that is that is the, the connection in, there. <laughs> in defense of Rokana, he is saying out loud what most people in politics are saying quietly. Um, but but the, okay, so there's the Rokanas of the world saying this. But the other day, uh, Amy Klobuchar, the Maybe senator not most people. from from Minnesota. <laughs> more of a centrist. Yeah. She said sort of a, in a very Minnesota nice way, she said, well, yes, you know, she <laughs> his, except her staff. Uh, and she, uh, <laughs> if she were to, um, it, it takes, thank you, <laughs> comb reference. The, uh, 
it, it, Feinstein should come back soon or else we're gonna, we should maybe think about that, about, about she should maybe think about resigning. And so once the, she starts losing the Klobuchar's of the world, then maybe things will change. Okay, so of the other, basically three candidates who are announced or about, has Barbara Lee officially announced? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah okay, yeah, yeah. so did. Barbara Lee, Katie Porter, uh, Adam Schiff, do a little bit of handicapping. Who's the strongest out of the gate so far or who's lining up behind whom? You mentioned uh, Pelosi behind Adam Schiff. Yeah. Yes. Well, that was a big coup for him, although I, you know, I don't think that's going to win anybody a Senate seat. One endorsement. I mean, really, like, because... Well, it, it, it insulates him because if, yeah. if he's... Only in California would the perhaps the be... It's a disadvantage to be a... A, a middle-aged white man. <laughs> so, uh, but it and is, former prosecutor. it is, and former prosecutor. And so to have Pelosi come out, he's running against uh, two progressive women. That you know, kind of insulated him for that. I don't know what, what you know. Short term. Other than that. Yeah, I mean, I think both he and Porter are have very strong fundraising numbers. I think the interesting thing about Katie Porter is like, on paper, she is. Like he, like he's more of a moderate and she's more of a progressive, mm -hmm. but she's also a populist and. The right hates Adam Schiff with like a passion that you cannot imagine. So, unless you watch Fox News and then you could just watch it. Um, so like, Porter has this kind of opening potentially to get some more conservative candidates that I think will be really fascinating to watch because she does have that populist message. Anti-establishment. Anti-establishment. And even though, again, like she should kind of fall on that list of enemies if you're like in the MAGA world I think that she's just not been out there as much she wasn't leading impeachment the way Schiff was right and she that's in, in, she's running on oversight I'm gonna run on so uh, sexy it, yeah <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> But she can. She makes it about as sexy yeah. as you can with the whiteboards and grilling the CEOs and saying these people are screwing you over. What was her recent <laughs> analogy? Like it's as messy as my minivan. <laughs> it's as messy as my... She I did the. She did the podcast uh, once from her minivan. She's like, okay, I, my kids are too loud. I got to go in the minivan and do it. And I was like, are you rolling down the windows at least. It seems like <laughs> this is gonna be. We're gonna yeah, be a right. while. So, yeah. but, so and then uh, Barbara Lee, of go. course. <clears throat> Uh, progressive uh, uh, icon. Uh, he, she was the lone vote against the, uh, the, the decision to go to war uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, but she, we're, we're talking about this before we came on, and she is really not well known. Um, uh, we, outside you know, we of the Bay Area. Outside yeah. of the Bay Area. We don't know her. And, uh, and I think Katie um, uh, Porter and Schiff have the advantage of being sort of you know, MSNBC strong, you know, they, yeah. they're on. They have these viral moments. They, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah done, I mean, you've all seen him here. I think I interviewed yeah, him. Yeah. Was... Like, yeah. But she wrote a book too, so you know. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, th there's been a lot of conversation and Barbara Lee's been very open about this before she ran that like, sh you know, it has always <clears throat> been harder for black female candidates to raise money and she's always been in a safe seat, so she hasn't had that pressure. I mean, Katie Porter was like baptism by fire, right? Coming yeah. in, flipping an Orange County seat. Um, I think Schiff, you know, has been such a big part of Democratic leadership and that sort of powerhouse with Pelosi of raising money that they really have that kind of like structural advantage on that. And the truth is, sadly, in California, that's what you need to run a race. You can't, this is not a retail politics state, it's just right. too big, so. <laughs> Four to five million dollars a week to just run TV ads uh, uh, in Los Angeles. So I mean, so you're going to piss away. Math. Yeah. What are people saying? This could be a hundred, two hundred million dollars. Yeah. Oh campaign. my God. Yeah. All told. Yeah. Uh, true or false? Whoever does get the Democratic nomination for that race wins. Well, no, it's a top two. Right? Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's top two, top, top two. two race. So yeah. top two, whoever, regardless of party. Right now. So unless there's a spoiler from the right, who can come in and edge out two Dems, and then of course, yes. If if Eric Early wins the top two, I think the Democrat has it in the bag. Well, I noticed that Lonnie Chen has continued his messaging from. Yeah, his I got campaign. that email yesterday too. Yeah, do you think he's? Got I don't think on? so. I, I mean, I should. I haven't checked in with him lately, but I remember him telling me that you know this this race. The, the race that he ran for before Control. was something that he felt like a Republican could win statewide in California. It's sort of a you know good government type of yeah. office oversight, position yeah. oversight. Um, so I don't know this. I it, it, it was he did a, a very good job raising money for that. He outraised his opponent Amelia Cohen who won. But um, I mean that's you're talking as we said tens of millions of dollars uh, to to run. And I don't know if the the, the money's there for a Republican. Okay. 
Well, while we're on California politics and gov gubernatorial powers, I wanted to touch on the, uh, to ask what you thought about the Lieutenant Governor. Eleni Kunalakis. Say that two times fast. Eleni Kunalakis, Eleni Kunalakis. <laughs> <laughs> Tani Kantil Sakaue. That's the one I'm that's, still proud of. Yeah, that's she spoke here. Um, the lieutenant governor, <laughs> I'll just call her because I can't. LG. <laughs> LG. Anyway, LG uh, what do you think about her kicking off her campaign this early, and and what are her prospects? Gavin Newsom did the same thing in 2015. It's uh, it's a way to get out there early, start raising money. I don't think raising money is going to be a problem for her. Uh, she is a, a nationwide net. She's tapped into a nationwide network of fundraising because of her her dad, who was a, uh, a, a prominent developer in Sacramento, Greek immigrant, um, and, you know, sort of rose up from you know working in the fields and and then started his own uh, development company. Um, so she was. She was a big time Obama donor, so raising money is not gonna be a problem for her. Uh, getting people to, to know her and be able to say her name will be her problem. <laughs> So that, that can no, also you can work for you because that that's makes real. it stand yeah, out. Yeah, you're not, there's not going to yeah, be six real. other people with your name on the ballot. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, you know, she's being represented by the same consultants who ran Newsom's campaign, Kamala Harris's Senate campaign I just talked about, uh, Alex lost Rick, Rick Russo's, but yeah. I guess that's one of the few. And so, like, they have a playbook that they have been kind of working on and it includes trying you know get out there early try to clear the field um like make it so that you know maybe people who are considering jumping in the race don't want to because they see your fundraising numbers or the attention you're getting um i think that's way easier to do with a kamala harris than it is with someone like laney kunalakis who's just not a household name um and i think it's going to be really fascinating to see kind of how she runs this race right because She's very close with the governor. She, you know, I mean, it's a separate constitutional office, but really, when you are a lieutenant governor, like any shine you get comes because the governor allows you to take on stuff and to be out front. So she has a real vested interest besides her personal relationship with him and clearly sharing a political consultant and a lot of donors in like fostering that. But if you're running for governor of California, you're probably gonna have to talk about what's wrong, right? And you're probably gonna have to blame somebody. Um, so. We'll see. I, I expect at this point that it will be a very crowded <clears throat> field. Well, shit. The things she did say she wanted to talk about, income inequality, homelessness, and et cetera, were a lot of the same things Gavin Newsom has Was almost talking. Yeah. Different so the, right. the obvious question is kind of... Yeah. How do you push that forward? How do you make, well, how do you make a difference between you without completely yeah. slamming your predecessor? I don't know. <laughs> um, Eleni Kunalakis. There we there go. There you go. Yeah. We should end now because I'm not going to get any better than that. <laughs> Well, let's We're going to come on. back at the end. <laughs> uh, let's move on to our next topic. So what has happened since the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade? Let's think about this. Uh, there have been a number of high-profile elections that have been won by Democrats where abortion was a key issue, a couple of low-profile elections that became high-profile elections because abortion was an issue. Uh, Republican legislators, uh, legislators excuse me, in GOP-controlled states have passed or proposed laws further criminalizing abortion, the women who seek them, doctors who perform them, and even anyone deemed to have helped a woman get one, including any, helping in any way a woman traveling from one of those GOP-controlled states to a state where it uh, remains legal. And most recently, a judge in Texas ruled that... Miffy Pristone. I did an entire hour of forum unable to say it, and now that it's over, I can say it. So, you know. Okay. <laughs> no, that was a hard one for me, too. I, I, go, I just go with Miffy. Even the governor says <laughs> that, Miffy. That's what the kids call it on the Even street. Even Miffy, yes. Even the governor says Miffy. Um, rule that that, the most common form of abortion in the country, should be banned because he says it didn't get properly vetted before it was approved. The U.S. Supreme Court has put that ruling on hold until its appeal is heard further in the courts. <sighs> so, Marissa, with that long introduction, tell us where we are on this and, and right. kind of what is the state of play? So on Friday night, the Supreme Court decided not to allow his ruling to go into effect. So now we're kind of in a waiting game while the appeals process plays out. So for now, it is available, um, although I'm sure there are states where... I mean, it's not it's not available if abortion is illegal, although you, you know there has been some shipping over whatever. So, um, I mean, I think 
in some ways, like that was the most sort of potent and interesting thing about that and this whole debate was like, for the first time since Dobbs was overturned, people in states like California were going to have access restricted, right? Like this was yeah. not just states. And, and it really, in some ways, what the Supreme Court did on Friday stands in line with w their rationale in Dobbs, which is that this should be a state decision. Like going beyond that, it, which Alito apparently wanted to, um, which is ironic because he wrote Dobbs, so now he's trying to overrule himself, I guess. But he, he <laughs> had a dissent um, from this unsigned uh, decision on Friday, essentially saying that, you know, <clears throat> it, it shouldn't, anyway, it doesn't matter, it's two in the weeds. <laughs> Uh, if you want, the New York Times had a great analysis on it. I'll leave it at that. Adam Liptak can take that one. Link um, to that. But yeah, I mean, I think where it stays now, I mean, obviously the court cases will continue to play out, but to your point, like, it is in the court of public opinion. It yeah. is in the politics. We saw just a massive victory in Wisconsin a couple of weeks ago for that Supreme Court justice who ran on a pro-abortion rights message. Um, I was down last week uh, in La Quinta where the American Association of Political Consultants was meeting, and I met one of the Democrats who ran that campaign. And, you know, I think this is where it's getting really interesting for Republicans is like, it's not just abortion. I mean, they have now built on an existing, you know, kind of grassroots network in Wisconsin um, that they're really optimistic about going into 2024 as Democrats. And so some of the organizing and politics that are kind of the fallout from Dobbs could have bigger ripple effects, not just in, you know, judicial races or races where abortion's on the ballot. Um, that's probably not a lot of comfort to women in states where you know, there's no access, but I do think that this is like, you know, rocking a hard place for Republicans right now. Oh yeah, and <clears throat> which and also a little bit about how these abortion drugs work. Mifepristone is usually used in combination with a drug called misoprostol. He's and showing off. <laughs> <laughs> I've been so they, but if you if you if there's no mifepristone, women can still patients can still get an, an abortion, but instead of taking one dose of misoprostol, you would have to take three or four. It takes this way longer, right? Way longer, and it can cause a severe, very painful cramping. And the concern is among abortion providers, they're like, some people might not complete this or might not do it after the first one or two times. And then you're like, okay, now where am I? And so it's Which just is ironic another... because the whole rationale of this judge in Texas was that the FDA, you know, this wasn't safe, that it wasn't properly vetted 20 years ago. We've now had, I mean, what, hundreds of thousands, millions of millions, people Millions, five, five million people have used this drug yeah. in 20 years. Um, uh, so it's, it's, you're, you're making it, you're exactly right, you're making it harder and more painful uh, by eliminating this. And plus, it's like, this is a huge leap for a federal judge to just say, well, right. hey, oh, FDA, uh, not based on any real hard science here, but you're wrong on this. I mean, that's why the which big is, pharma is yeah. like, is freaked out about it. Which this. is like what makes it a really interesting case when it, because it will end up in the Supreme Court, especially yes. given the fact that the appeals court already largely sided with this lower court judge. Like, I think this Supreme Court is going to have a really interesting... Ooh balance to make, you know, it's like corporate interest uh, in our entire drug approval process, which is, you know, yeah. I mean, the FDA is on the side with pharma on this one, right? Yeah. Um, but it's definitely kind of, you know, even like abortion issue aside, however you feel about that, like a lot of the sort of n nuts and bolts of this case feel like insanely overreach by this judiciary. Yeah, judge and here. it will come back in the middle of the campaign. The decision one way or the other is going to come back. Or his uh, ethics forms, apparently. His ethics? The, that judge. Oh, uh, this judge in, in Texas, the federal, federal judge, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, he has been kind of been raked over the coals by CNN. That is, I would swear they've just been going through his garbage. So like, <laughs> <laughs> his last 20 years of garbage. Yes, he didn't do this right. He didn't say this in a, in a meeting. Um, and I'm not in a position of knowing how much of that is, is, uh, is noteworthy and how much of it is literally just trying to make a... Yeah, a, I mean, stick. Well, I he think didn't it just declare, adds He didn't, to he the didn't declare uh, that some holdings, financial holdings that he had that represented like 85% of his wealth or something like that. Uh, but it's also, it goes to Clarence Thomas and these, these judges aren't, uh, don't have the same disclosure requirements as every other politician does. Right. And so they can, you know, like Clarence Thomas, it, it was, he had his, his mom, uh, some uh, billionaire with Harlan Crow, brought, bought his mom's house and renovated it and let his mom live there rent-free. 
Well, I mean, that the, doesn't. You don't have that set up. <laughs> no, I well, and, and apparently, and the private jets. Well, I, I, yeah. The travel private jets, yeah. But he also apparently uh, was part of a decision that the court, Supreme Court, did involving Harlan Crow. Um, that Harlan Crow says he didn't know anything about, but but who among us doesn't have a billionaire best friend with a private jet? I mean, <laughs> it's just it's San Francisco in San Francisco anyway. especially. Yeah, There's <laughs> billionaires everywhere. They love us. They don't love us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let's move on to uh, the Las Vegas A's and the politics of sport. Aww. Not yet, not yet. Las Vegas A's still at the Oakland A's. Well, the Oakland A's might be heading to Vegas. <laughs> This might at first sound like a story, really, that ESPN should be covering, and I'm sure they are, but I don't know, I don't watch ESPN. But uh, <laughs> whenever a professional sports team uh, either leaves or arrives in a city, it usually involves millions of dollars in taxpayer funds, as well as like zoning and, and uh, you know, construction permit pressure. Um, the athletics have signed a binding agreement to purchase land in Las Vegas to build a new ballpark after more than five decades in Oakland. Joe? Define binding. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a, a land deal. If they, if they wanted to get out of it, they would say, you know, would, they would just sell the land. You know, if they, it's a, it's a, that's a real estate deal. That's, you know, small potatoes. Um, but the, the uh, A's are going to have a, they still have a hard problem. They're going to have to get uh, the, well, the Nevada legislature to, to give them all sorts of tax benefits. That's not a done deal. Uh, and they still have to raise the money. And they have sort of a timeline on this because if the A's don't have a stadium deal in place by the first of the year, then they, use, they lose their revenue sharing uh, dollars. And the A's are so cheap, they need these revenue, revenue sharing dollars from the Major League Baseball. It's, so it's not a done deal, but it kind of looking like it is because uh, last week, uh, the um, city of Oakland mayor got a call from the uh, team president of the A's and said, uh, hey, by the way, uh, I know we're in our, you know, we're closing in on a deal here in Oakland, but we just purchased that there's a story it's going to break, you're going to see it, and we just bought some land in Nevada where we're going to build a stadium. And the mayor of Oakland, Shang Tao, has been in office for about four months. She's like, you're, we're done. We're not talking anymore. You want to talk to me? Call me. And then we'll go from there. It's a, you know it's a gutsy move. It's you know uh, it's, it's, whoever's in office and, and Tao isn't going to be blamed for this. I mean she will be blamed, but she probably shouldn't be. She's only been there a few months. Whoever's in office when the A, when and if the A's move is going to get blamed for this. So <clears throat> it's kind of a gutsy move to say no. I'm done with you. I'll talk to the hand. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. Um, so Oakland lost the Warriors, the Raiders, and we now... share the Warriors. We, we, we share. Yeah, yeah, that's a regional team, and they were they they, they made their their owners made clear from the from the get go saying you know we love you Oakland, great yeah. fans, but uh, we'd yeah, like they, to have build a beautiful stadium. Across. Oakland lost the Warriors, the Raiders, yeah. <laughs> and the A's. Yeah. I mean, is, I mean, is this a, does the this Raiders? Reflect... That's okay though. I'm, yeah. I'm well, does about this that. reflect on professional sports, or does Oakland have a problem? Are they just not big enough for the local market? Well, that's, that's the question I was asking them. And they said, well, you know, hey, we, we did support all three of these teams for many years, for, for you know, probably 40, 50 years, all three of them. Uh, so we can support them. That said, Oakland does not have um, the, the, you know, they don't have a, a glitzy new stadium like ever. The, the Coliseum's the oldest stadium in the league. Um, and it's, you know, you see all these fancy baseball-only ballparks. It's almost exclusively what they are now. And they don't have that. And they don't have a downtown ballpark where you can, you know, like uh, Oracle Park, where you can walk there and take public transportation very easily there. You can do that with Oakland, but they want a downtown ballpark where you can do that. And they, the development they were proposing in Oakland was $13 billion. I mean, it was like a massive, uh, one of the biggest in California, one of the biggest in the country. If you've ever been down there to that, to where Howard Terminal is, you're, you'd look there and I go, really, here? That's very tight area. It's hard to get to from public transportation. The A's were proposing building a gondola from BART, which when you hear that idea, you're like, uh, like come on, <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, so um, was that the first bong hit uh, yeah. on the Commonwealth <laughs> Club stage? Most of the audience wasn't sure what yeah, you were doing. That's, that's like, uh, so anyways, that's where we're at now with the A's. And it's, it's sad. I live in Oakland. Um, I'm, you know, full transparency. I'm not an A's fan, but uh, <laughs> but I, you know, I go to a game, you know, one or two games a year. But it's like, um, it's really sad because the the ballpark would have brought in 
uh, you know, by some estimates, you know, $7 billion over 10 years and 6,000 jobs. And if you built out, I talked to a union leader the other day, uh, you, those jobs that have been there, building the ballpark, building the housing, all the other developments, those are lifetime jobs. You could work, you could have a, the, the trades unions, they could be 20 year jobs for people. Um, and that won't happen now. My favorite uh, story, um, true I believe, um, involving cities and trying to keep sports teams was in the, I guess it was the 1990s, maybe late 80s, I don't know when this was, that Chicago and Illinois were trying to keep the White Sox from moving to Arizona. Oh, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, they finally put together this package and you know, they built new Comiskey, it was gonna be built right across the street from old Comiskey Park, okay. No. They had to like, all the complications that had to be done in getting all these different financing sources, there had to be a vote in the state legislature, and they're in the legislature, they're you know, arguing and they're getting together the coalitions, and they had to do it by midnight for whatever reason, that was I guess the extension of the term of time that they had to do this. And they get like almost to midnight, and they're not done. So this being Illinois, they just had someone go up and turn the clock back. <laughs> And they got the it done does. in time. You know Legis what? They do that in Sacramento. Do they? Not yeah. physically turn the clock, but they essentially stop the clock. <laughs> they do. Like no. there's a mechanism because at the end of a two year session, they have to end by midnight, but they'll like suspend <laughs> the time essentially. It's like Ferris so, Bueller's day off. Yeah. The clock yeah. So anytime a lawmaker forever. tells you like something's impossible, just know that they're lying because <laughs> they can like literally stop time if they actually want to. <laughs> okay. Do you think so? Are Giants fans, are you happy, kind of schadenfreude-ish about this? Or is that rivalry, the local rivalry, yeah, I something think it's really sad. cool? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. me too. <sighs> Not in a like, you know, we feel bad for it. <laughs> yeah, but kind of. Okay. <laughs> but, but kind of. Like Oakland has problems. I mean, we all have problems. Yes. Well, this will make the Oaklanders feel good. Let's talk about a problem here in San Francisco. That is our fentanyl crisis. Uh, the crisis of fentanyl deaths is, of course, a nationwide problem. Uh, San Francisco's has been used by, as an example by critics to uh, you know, argue that it's an out-of-control city. Recently, Governor Newsom announced that he would send in the National Guard to help the city deal with the fentanyl crisis. Marissa, what? Get ready, man. It's going to be like, what? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I think there's like potentially some practical things that the CHP and National Guard can help local police with. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and say we don't have huge problems and, you know, that the street behavior in itself is a problem as well in addition to the horrific um, fentanyl crisis, although those things are intertwined. Um, it feels a little bit like Newsom getting pushed by the national media and kind of being like, what can I do? Um, but I do think some of the stuff that they've been doing at the southern border that involves the National Guard, some of the interdiction work, and then just like some of the details of what they're saying they might do is actually, like, it makes some sense. Um, but as usual with Newsom, they're like, we're doing this. And you're like, when? And they're like, soon, it's, it's, soon. It's, it's, it's a little hazy it what exactly this I'm appointing will be. a black woman to the Senate. <laughs> yes. It's a little hazy what, a this, what the National Guard's going to do. And then Peskin There wants... were some more details today. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there were more? Okay, yeah. I've not caught up explain with what Peskin details. Did. Yeah. Peskin has asked Nancy Pelosi and BART police and UC police, because UC is a campus uh, downtown. Or not Hastings. We don't call it that anymore. Oh, we don't call it. I said UC. I didn't say Hastings. I know, I, I did. <laughs> okay. Right. So uh, to kind of pull together their forces, literally their force, their, their um, law enforcement forces, to try and figure out how to patrol down there mm -hmm. uh, in the common areas, UN Plaza. I mean, you know... The, the the challenge here is like uh, this is the reigniting the drug war. I mean, right? You can't. Uh, can you? Uh, can we? Everybody Although, wants. It's, yeah. You know, part of it. You, yes, sure. you want to arrest uh, 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 the drug dealers and prosecute them. Blah blah blah. But you know. It, I mean, I do think one of the things about the city right now that is like so shocking to those of us who live here, and especially from people who come, is it feels so lawless, right? And there is a sense. I mean, I was driving down past the federal building on a Saturday evening recently, and there was just hundreds of people, like hundreds, in front of the federal building, which I found sort of ironic because they've always been so, you know, high security, um, 
clearly most people, you know, were high and whatever. And it's just like, it, and it feels super unsafe and terrible, right? So I do think that there's some questions about like, can we just like hold this ground? Like one thing I've heard, um, I was talking to another supervisor, Asha Safai, and he, you know, he was saying the SFPD says like, we could just use help. Like once we clear areas and kind of move people along to just kind of hold that space. Um, and so I do think that some of that, like the street behavior stuff, could, right, but are they gonna really, like they say they're gonna go after dealers and people more high level, right. like. And they're still at the treatment beds here. We don't, what do we do with yeah, them? Yeah, where are we where, where are we Where are we gonna Although, put people? there's Just certainly people who the are on the streets <clears throat> using drugs that have housing as well. Like there's, like, it's very hard to disentangle what is the homeless problem, what is the drug problem, and where, you know, where is their overlap? And that's been an issue. I forever. Mean, forever, yes. I mean, from my entire time in San Francisco. Um, I, and I mean, the, there have been a lot of street problems that, that the city has either been dealing with or not been dealing with for quite some time. I have a friend who used to work in the federal building, and he used to talk about how, yeah, they would be, I mean, there would be like official warnings, you know, don't go outside alone, <laughs> go with a friend, go directly to where you're going, it's, it's a dangerous area. Um, San Francisco. Um, so San Francisco is also chronically understaffed in the police department. Mm. Uh, now supervisors Catherine Stephanie and Matt Dorsey have introduced a charter amendment uh, that would reestablish a goal for a certain level of departmental staffing, uh, which would be met within five years through a budget set aside. Um, voters, I guess, might see this on the ballot in 2024. Do you think things have changed that we've gone from the There's city a magic elected... number, and if we had it at SFPD, none of this would be a problem. Yeah. Well, I mean, the when problem... they're looking at, like, yeah. number of sworn officers <laughs> per capita, right. San Francisco's low even compared to But the to problem is we can't recruit people. Like, it's, it's not actually that we're, like, we don't have the money to pay them or whatever. I also have big <laughs> questions about, like, how... Well, I shouldn't tell in front of Joe. I have a story idea. Never mind. But anyway... Um, <laughs> But like, yeah, how many, I mean, what I was gonna say is like, what's the rate, like how many command staff do we have versus like rank and file officers? I mean, this is again, a regional and statewide issue. There is a problem recruiting police officers and public safety workers. There's a problem keeping them. And you can, you know, we have a charter mandated number 900 and something sworn officers that already exist. We're not even meeting that. Well, didn't, didn't that get rescinded in 2020? That we no longer have the mandate. Well, the, and the problem with any kind of number but, in the like, charter is that you have to you have to hit that number all the time, or that's the goal to hit the number all the time. What if things improve? Then, right. Then it's like, oh, well, maybe we only need six hundred yeah. officers. Yeah. I mean, this is like maybe ballot we, we, box we, budgeting to its nth yeah, degree, that's, right? That's never a good idea. Um, because you are stipulating not only a number, but then you are walling off funds that can then not be used for other things. I mean, and to get to the bigger debate, like. You know, one of the things Democrats have really had to sort of fall back on is this whole defund movement. But I think that was a strategy issue, not not like a policy issue. Like you can't say we need to not send police officers to everything. We should have social workers and then take away all the cops, but not have the social workers. Right. Yes. Like that's backwards. You have to do both. You have to invest in both. Um, and so to Joe's point, I think that some of the ideas, you know, that are out there and programs that are happening in cities like this have the opportunity and police officers will tell you like they would like that to happen yes. they don't want to be they want to do police work. work yeah yeah um but yeah I, this feels a little bit like a blunt instrument I'm, I'm a little skeptical as you can tell okay very good um well let's move on to a fun topic uh presidents and would-be presidents uh the january 6th insurrection if you didn't hear it was unsuccessful <clears throat> so the country will in fact have another presidential election that's the good news <laughs> The bad news is that voters keep telling pollsters they're not really thrilled about the candidates who are on display. Um, they're not happy with the likely options, which in fact might well end up being a replay of the 2020 election. So let's talk a bit about the 2024 race for the White House. Um, let's start with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Oh, God. Oh, it's a, Do we have to? You're all fans, I can tell. Um, He'll apparently go up against Marianne Williamson for the anti-vax vote. I don't know. He's getting, of course, a lot of play on Fox. Is this just... Because they love everything. Yeah. 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 Well, okay, so he's, if, if you haven't been following this, you know, part of the thing about being a Kennedy running for any office is you've got the Kennedy name, you've got the Kennedy connections, you've got the Ken Kennedy money. Unless. <laughs> and you get a bit of the Kennedy machine, if you will, the political machine behind you. They're not lining up against him, are they? Against him? I'm sorry, they're not lining up with him. 
Yeah, you, you have that unless you pissed <laughs> off everybody who's a Kennedy not even related to you. Right, I think the, the, his, his anti-vax uh, stance kind of alienates a lot of the Democratic, potential Democratic funders he may have or support he may have. I mean, I don't, I don't know what his long game is. He's smart enough to know that he like doesn't Like it feels like a spoiler move. Yeah. So who, I don't even know, but I, but can who, he get for, enough to spoil? On behalf of whom? Yeah, I don't, I don't, he's, if you get enough to spoil. Um, and Marianne, Marianne Williamson, man, I saw her on the, on the campaign trail last year. Uh, did you have her on the, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we had her, had her on the podcast. She's great. And she, man, I went to one of her events. People love her. I mean, love her personally, like, because she is, her writing, her speaking has, like, viscerally, personally helped them. President of the United States. I mean, you know, that's another. That's kind of a leap. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I think it's Biden's biggest uh, <laughs> biggest challenge is going to be apathy because <laughs> literally, when I wrote this, seventy percent of Americans says they say they don't want him to run, including fifty one percent of Democrats. It's like, whoops! Like, wow, that's. That's a lot of people disinterested in you <laughs> at this point. So is there, because he's apparently getting close to possibly. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, okay. No. Um, is there, are we getting any hints of like what his campaign will be about or will it still be just, I'm finish not Finish the job. We're, I want to, I need to finish the job. Yeah. <laughs> finish the job. I assume uh, yes. abortion is going to play a big uh, role. Yeah. Yes, yes. But I mean, his can he's going to say, here's what we did in our first term. We have more work to do. You know, I, I've led this, you know, state. I've had been a... You the know, transition is not over. Yeah. The trans, yeah trans, he was going to be a transitory figure, whatever. No, he didn't say transitory. He said, what did he say? I see myself as a transitional, trans, like a transitional president. Or transitional transitional president. president. Okay. And then apparently that means they were like, yeah, we were going to transition a lot of jobs and make this a more diverse administration. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see what he says tomorrow. Okay. But that, that's the, the basic theme. Uh, Marisa, how about the Republicans? I mean, we've seen DeSantis, and for a while he was attracting the internal Republican anti-Trump yeah. vote. I think he might have messed up by not announcing when he was, like, peaking a little bit. There's definitely some, among Republicans, some concern that, you know, he essentially kind of missed his shot. Back to abortion, a six-week ban, like, not popular, even with their base. I mean, that's very extreme. Yeah. Um, and he really, like, hasn't figured out a lane with Trump. And I get him wanting to not kind of get down in the mud immediately with the former president, but I think at this point it's making him look kind of weak. And and his whole case is, like, that Trump is weak, right? Like, because he's not trying to not be a MAGA right. candidate. He's, like, the best argument for DeSantis is, like, Trump's a loser. He keeps losing, right? Yeah. I can win. Um, but I feel like if he can't kind of bring it to you know and trump has pulled down a single punch um he seems to be enjoying himself punching at desantis and then everybody else is just like a nobody i mean and none of them none of the others wanted uh <laughs> pompeo to did bow out i mean he bowed out but, <laughs> he but says, none of the others want to differentiate themselves from trump well, well chris christie do that? is supposedly going to make that oh, chris christie, oh yeah that's yeah, gonna okay. he's, he's not change the yeah game. it's not gonna happen uh but the other uh the I mean, one guy the problem. Who, there's not a lane for them there's not a lane for an anti-trumper yeah. there's not a lane for what, sununu chris sununu but he did i hear heard him over the weekend say tr he said exactly your message there was uh Trump is a loser. We ha he has lost repeatedly. My message. <laughs> Your message. <laughs> <I came up. laughs> but he's also he's also for abortion rights. Which yeah, he's means, way yeah, too yeah, yeah. centrist. He's I mean, too. and the thing is, the base of the party is still with Trump. So that is why Nikki Haley and Mike Pence. God, my poor Mike. Like. The man just can't take a hint. Like he goes to these places and he gets booed and he's like, "I'm running." I'm. It's just. It's well, wild. I don't understand. Here's why he won't In speak his out against Trump. He just got booed. He, oh my God! Well, he, he Trump supporters said, said hang, "Hang Mike, Mike Pence," <laughs> and he still won't speak mail of him. I don't understand that. It's a, it's a, it's a basic, not like, even a campaign strategy, like a you human don't interaction, have base, right? <laughs> so, like, they're lost to you. Yeah. Well, one thing I found really interesting is that Donald Trump has actually been speaking out and saying, you know, basically soft pedal the abortion topic. Right. That's yeah. a that's a loser for okay. us. That immediately has caused now at least two very public outbreaks mm -hmm. of criticism, very angrily from what I'm hearing, uh, from evangelical groups. Yeah, and the, yeah, and they're the, saying, "Look, we stuck with you through all the 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 women and the the 
payoffs and, and you all, gave all us that the stuff. Supreme Court. We got the Supreme Court to sit, folks, and now you're telling us basically, you know, you're, you're the freaks. And, you know, we we can't have you anymore. Um, Why do I honestly? I, and this one, I'll, I'll say that's smart politics from Trump. He's saying. Yeah. He said, "Hey, I, I, I gave the three the three justices. You, they, re, you know, rolled back row. That's what I promised. And let the states decide. That's and then that way he doesn't get all, all these other guys like Tim Scott, the, 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 the senator from <laughs> South painful. Carolina. Yeah, he got stuck in what was it fifteen weeks? Is it six weeks? Don't Trump? You know, he doesn't like no. Forget that. I'm we're done. I did abortion. Crossed it off my list. Promise, promise kept. Okay." Uh, speaking of elections and the results, what do you make of the recent uh, Dominion voting systems uh, uh, settlement with Fox News? And, popcorn. <laughs> and to tie this all in, what you, is it connected with Tucker? Or how much of it? It's got to be partly. I th I, we were just talking backstage. I feel like with Tucker Carlson's firing, we don't, we don't know what we don't know to yes, quote a, too a much. former cabinet official. <laughs> yes. There's the, the known rum, unknowns the and the known yes. knowns <laughs> and the Rumsfeld. Um, Something else must have happened, or they must know something, right? Because it's just the timing seems weird. But yeah, I mean, tell me what happened. Because we don't, the, oh. today they what happened with uh, so yeah, they, Tucker. They, 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 like they had his they show. They sacked planned. him this morning. They apparently still had promos running for his evening show, so it came pretty quick. He did not get to do his sign off. Um, you know, he was at the real heart of this Dominion case. A lot of his text messages where he went after Trump and you know called, you know people with terrible names um but he's also being sued by a former booker on his show who says that she was you know subject to harassment and terrible workplace environment and it does seem to be some overlap with some of the dominion uh evidence so it could be related to that case i mean we don't know and he um it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens on fox because remember he took over for o'reilly about six seven years ago you're like oh how could you replace bill o'reilly he had you know two three million uh, people watching him every night tucker pulled in the same audience uh, eventually and so is it is it just is it fox is it the uh is it just time someone slot. with that message is it the time slot um and you know, this is uh, O'Reilly. Uh, you know, he he was uh, he left in the cloud of sort of a sexual harassment sexual, yeah. uh, 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 lawsuit and such. Um, but he he's landed on his feet. He's he was writing all his uh, everybody people get murdered or books, and he's got his. Uh, his oh, <laughs> I yes. He them. and Stacey Abrams could <laughs> yes, have. A, yes, <laughs> that would be a great <laughs> great book club. Uh, so uh, and then. Uh, and Glenn Beck, remember Glenn Beck from uh, years ago? Well, he went and he had he got his started his own uh, um, uh, sort of network, and he's doing fine. He has a, a, a good radio show. Tucker will go. I think he's going to go the Joe Rogan route. Joe Rogan has a the most popular podcast, right? They're one of the top ten most popular podcasts. Yeah. He has a very lucrative contract with Spotify, I think. Uh, so you know, there's many other platforms other than Fox that. Um, if for all of you who are super worried about Tucker. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Will he land on his feet with his tens of millions of dollars yes. that Fox has already so he, paid him yeah, but and it, probably is giving him in severance? Yeah, so I mean, that's, uh, we'll see what happens to Fox, but they seem to have a, you know, a, a, a bench of, of people who I say the same thing. I will make a prediction. Things. I do not think that the Dominion outcome will change anything about the way Fox does business. Yeah. Except for they might take Willie Brown's advice which is that the e and email is for evidence and you shouldn't write that stuff down <laughs> all these texts man they could have just picked up well they've got another multi-billion dollar lawsuit against them from another uh voting company so yes yeah. smartmatic um, yeah which apparently only operated in one city so i think their their ask is a little high <laughs> compared to dominions well let's get through a, a few of the questions from the audience before we get to the uh news quiz uh, do you have any predictions on the debt ceiling negotiations? Mm -hmm. McCarthy took his plan to Wall Street, and but he's got some trouble, I guess, convincing his entire conference on it. Or Wall Street. Uh, what was the response on Wall Street? I, I didn't hear that. Not, not good. I mean, I, and also, uh, he can't afford to lose more than, what, four or five votes. And I think if three of them have already said they're not voting <laughs> yeah, for so anything. His, that, it could be chaos. And if there's a shutdown, remember what happened in uh, Newt Gingrich? Uh, and, and Clinton had a, had a disagreement over this uh, similar thing. And uh, 
and, and Clinton, uh, uh, the Republicans are just coming off a big wave election, 1994, and then they, uh, you know, uh, Clinton was reelected. Clinton was seen as being in trouble. Then he, you know, he, the voters, for whatever reason, blamed the Republicans for shutting down the government. And so he, uh, McCarthy's got to be careful. He doesn't want to be, uh, to follow what, ha what happened to Newt. I mean, I feel like McCarthy at this point is like the game he's playing is to stay a speaker, right? Yeah. Like that is his biggest concern, which doesn't bode well for, you know, our nation and the banking system. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not, I don't want to make any predictions, but well, I think it could be a messy summer. Someone did ask your thoughts on the performance of Kevin McCarthy so far. Um, Sounds like very unfinished. What performance? Well, I don't, he, these guys, the Republicans ran on what? Crime is, is out of control and the inflation is out of control, but the, the, their most high profile thing is about, about trans kids. I mean, so um, was it, that's not a, right. an, an issue that affects everyday Americans, uh, you know, like the ones that they ran on. So I don't, I, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's misguided. They're playing, they're playing to Fox. They're not playing yeah. to the people who put them in office. Well, listen, we've come to the end of our program. Thank you to our great panelists, Marisa Lagos, Joe Garofoli. Thank you, everyone here in the room, as well as everyone watching and listening online. We'll see you again in the future. Have a great, safe week. Take care.